80% of the Centre City was written off. I had 12 buildings in Centre City. I had not one left. Suddenly from being a property owner, I'm a property developer. It's now just over 10 years since the Canterbury earthquakes. Sarah's come and gone. There's a new mayor in town and a different political party in Wellington. In this episode, we talk to some of the key people involved in the rebuild of Christchurch, particularly its centre, and find out how they feel about progress. Well, actually, Christchurch is fantastic because it's, it's a rebirth. So it's exciting. It's actually going forward in leaps and bounds. Because the central city was closed for such a long time after the earthquakes, there's been concern about whether its rejuvenation would work and whether people would come back in from the suburbs. If you have a city without uh, a heart, it doesn't have a soul, so you, you've got to get the core of it right. And if, this, if the heart of the city is thriving, then the outlying areas will, um, as a matter of consequence, they, they will um, thrive as well, but it doesn't work the other way around. So, you know, if you want to go away to Sydney for a weekend, no one jumps on the internet and, or Trivago or what if and says Sydney suburbs. They say, I want to stay in Sydney central city. Now, that's not to say that the suburbs in Sydney aren't great. They are. They've got Paddington, Surrey Hills, and chances are those same people that have booked their weekend away will visit those areas. They'll visit the markets in Paddington. They'll go to the suburbs around Surrey Hills and enjoy themselves. But it's got to be the heart that draws them in. So I think the same should, should be um, accepted and, and, uh, and you know, deeply embedded in our consciousness in Christchurch, that if we don't get the heart right, the rest is a waste of time. So it will benefit the New Brightons, the Akaroas, the Rickertons, the Hornbys, if the heart is strong. But Christchurch isn't going to thrive just because it has a strong mall out in Hornby. <laughs> the city centre is certainly taking shape, and people seem to be returning to use the new buildings, However, there's still a lot of vacant land throughout the CBD. So in, in some examples, there are still insurance issues, which I think people outside of Christchurch might not have an appreciation for. Sure. They say, well, you had a replacement policy and why don't you just get on with it? They're being greedy. That's not the case. There are a lot of people that have you know, gone through the ringer with the insurers and there's no end in sight for them. And that's terribly sad. Uh, there are other people, and I think this is sad for the community and for the city, that have had an insurance payout. Um, they've turned it into, in some cases, a car park, and they're getting some income from it in, in, in the short term. Uh, or they've done nothing with it because it doesn't owe them anything, and they're just fine now that they've had a tidy payout. Um, and they're sitting back and saying, do you know what, let's just wait and see. Now, I think that's really cancerous to our progress as a city, and I think that the acid should be tipped on them to hurry up and either develop that site or sell it to someone that will, because there's no shortage of people that do want to uh, back the city, and that's really encouraging. But the people that are hanging on to these derelict sites um, is, is not helpful. When you talk about local developers in Christchurch, or people that have done development or redevelopment and the rebuild of the city, very often uh, pre-2010, 2011, they, they were less developers and more investors. So they tended to be asset owners who had significant assets in the city in terms of built form. And uh, by dint of what happened, they, they started to, they had to either um, sell up and move out or they had to actually redevelop their assets. And so they became developers, if you like. So uh, yeah, we hold, them, we hold them pretty dear to our hearts because uh, they had the choice, stay in Christchurch or go elsewhere, and they chose to stay. You know, when Sarah set up Christchurch and said, you know, we need to bring outside investment in and everything else, and they thought the Chinese were going to come rushing in and do lots of development. Didn't happen. It's the local passionate, slightly nutty people like me that have actually brought Christchurch together. And you've got to be totally passionate to do it because actually it doesn't make money at the moment. Some of that outside investment was meant to come from Wellington for blueprint or anchor projects. The theory was that the, uh, the Crown would uh, make a significant number of investments uh, and that would be the uh, catalyst for the private sector to be fast followers. The reality of Christchurch was that the private sector moved before faster than the government. And as we sit here today, there are still, uh, of those blueprint projects, there's still one that hasn't even started, construction. So th the short answer is the private sector moved much faster. There have been a number of projects which have been presented as part of the blueprint. And that was kind of, that was local government and central governments into the bargain. And they'll do that and the private sector is 
inspectors do their part. Now the private sector has done their part, so I think with these anchor projects that have been pushed out longer and longer, it's really a slap in the face to the people that have put their hard-earned capital into Christchurch. I always wondered why they called them the anchor projects. I now know why. They're stuck in the ground going nowhere. And thank God they're starting to come out of the ground, but it's been far too long. They should have been the lead pins. I'm, I'm pretty impatient at the best of times, <laughs> so it's certainly not ha happening fast enough. Um, but I, and I would I would place blame actually at our own council and and at the crown to a certain extent. People. Um, are understandably very frustrated when you, we still haven't got the likes of the Metro Sports Building, the Convention Centre um, or, or the Closed Roof Stadium. So it's really important, in my view, that Crown and Council pull a finger out and start delivering these things because you know, that, that, that was the package that was presented. It's definitely accepted by everyone involved that the Crown projects have taken far longer to start or finish than anticipated. But finding out why is difficult. There's, there's probably no time in an interview to talk about the level of frustration that I might feel about these matters. Um, but I've, uh, I've learnt that um, expression, that uh, I focus on the things I can change uh, rather than the things that um, it's just water under the bridge, I'm afraid. <laughs> I mean, one of the reasons is that uh, in this country we have um, a process on public sector projects around business cases. Part of that business case is the constant search for value for the taxpayer, uh, which, is, which is fair enough. If you're spending someone else's money, you should be, be realistic about it. But that constant search for, for value often means that you go around in circles on your business case, and that extends the time it takes to make decisions. And so uh, I think the other thing in Christchurch was that uh, we, were, we were looking at uh, public sector projects and applying a business as usual lens to the procurement and the way that they were dealt with when in fact uh, the landscape was not business as usual. The whole plan is really being put into place. So we are watching, albeit much slower in my mind than it should have been in a number of key areas, but we're seeing them put into place all of the things that we created. So there's been really very little change in terms of what the ultimate outcome will be, but definitely a change in timing. And no, I think that's holding us back a little bit personally. This program was made possible by the RNZ NZ On Air Innovation Fund.